Thank you for coming to this uh, third seminar on research data management organized by uh, HPC NRW. So we are live here from uh, the, one of the biggest supercomputing uh, uh, conferences, the International Supercomputing in Hamburg, and I hope that the uh, connection will be, will be good and stable, um, otherwise uh, we uh, well, you, you will you will realize. So I'm very excited today because uh, this time, um, despite the the last uh, few times where it was more um, um, theory based, we have an example now for practical research data management with Carl uh, uh, Bo and his team. And uh, you see an overview over uh, what expects you here. But let me just briefly tell uh, something about uh, the people that we are going to to uh, to listen to. Carl Bo is from the Research Institute uh, uh, for for Chemistry in Catalonia. He graduated in in chemistry at the University of Barcelona. He did his Master of Science in 1988, uh, studying homogeneous catalysis, and he got his PhD under uh, Professor Poblet. Uh, with the topic topological analysis of the electronic charge density function in transition metal compounds. He did research visits uh, in uh, Strasbourg in, uh, with professors De Dieu and Bernard, and uh, he did a postdoc in Amsterdam with Professor Behrens, and since uh, 1995 he's assistant professor in uh, physical chemistry at the University of Rovira i Virgili in Tarragona. I hope I didn't uh, uh, misspell this. Uh, his research, research is oriented to structure and reactivity of organometallic compounds, homogeneous catalysis, reaction mechanisms, sterics, and uh, electronic interactions. And he's also a co-author of the analysis program XIME, um, the density functional theory program ADF, and he's the leader in development of IOCMBD, which we are going to hear about uh, today. And he brought uh, two of his colleagues. One is uh, Moises Alvarez. I hope I, I spelled that right. He's a software engineer. Um, he studied IT engineering uh, at uh, in Tarragona, and he is responsible for development of IOCMBD and other tools. And uh, he also brought Dr. Diego Garay Ruiz, who obtained uh, a Bachelor of Science, Master in Chemistry. Uh, he has a Master of Science in Atomistic Multiscale Computational Modeling in Physics and Chemistry, Biochemistry at University of Barcelona and uh, Politecnica de Catalunya. He obtained his uh, PhD in the group of Carl Bo, and he is now postdoc uh, and responsible for the data format project. Maybe we will hear about this. And uh, he is uh, employing novel link databases for chemical information. So this is what is uh, expecting uh, you today. And uh, I hope um, we will will learn something, something practically oriented uh, regarding research data management. And it's a pleasure for me uh, to hand over to you, Carl, to start the session. Okay, thank you very much, Oliver, and thanks for your kind introduction. And especially thanks for inviting us to talk about our work uh, to this uh, prestigious audience. And well, I hope that at the end of the session, it's a two hours long session, yes, uh, you will end up with some new conclusions and uh, new ideas. And we hope that uh, our work will inspire you too. And this is why I brought, uh, I asked Moises, which is uh, the software engineer uh, in heat of the development of our platform to help me uh, to show some of the uh, utilities and uh, how to manipulate the platform. So the idea is to make a, a first an, an introduction about uh, what IOCMBD is and then show live demos of uh, the website and uh, the topics that uh, Moises and at the very end Diego will, uh, will show. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, the team uh, likes now uh, saying that uh, IOCMBD is uh, disrupting technology and uh, they found the uh, analogy with Netflix very appropriate in the sense that you all think you remember that in the past uh, we had shops uh, and uh, many places to go to pick a videotape and to visualize the tape at home and then bring back the tape and so far so on. Huh? And this radically changed it. Huh? 
uh, with Netflix, for instance, huh? these uh, video streaming platforms. Now we think we have all the data, all the videotapes, all the movies, huh? well categorized and very easy and accessible. Huh? Basically, now shops are open 24 by 7. Hmm? The user interface is very friendly. It's very easy to search for content, categories, and so on. Hmm? And well, it's flexible, portable, and apparently much more cost effective huh? than keeping the videotapes moving around the, the homes. Huh? And this is start, start exactly what we are doing with uh, IOCAM BD. Huh? So we are computational chemists and uh, we have to manage and to store and to keep the data of our previous studies and previous projects. And this is how all this started. Huh? We started with the CDs. Maybe still you remember CDs, huh? but then hard disks. And still we keep uh, a latest copy uh, of the data somewhere. Hmm? But now with IOCMBD, this radically changed. All the files are very easily accessible. We can access the results of our studies, of our previous studies. And what's uh, more relevant, uh, and you will see at the end of the talk, that we can work with the data today in a very efficient and fast manner. So in, also in the past, huh, still today, we had a mess of computational chemistry codes or theories or methods that we apply. Uh, many known programs as Gaussian or Orca or Gromax or Amber huh, are really workhorses that are bringing research forward both in academia and in companies. And this is a mess huh, because we have lots of uh, different formats lots of different kinds of files and also different supports. Huh? With IOCAM BD, BD, we unify firstly all the different file formats that the different codes produce in a format which is a well-structured uh, language which is called CML, Chemistry Markup Language, which is ideal hmm, to store properly the data in databases. Hmm? And the last point that our platform does is uh, to publish the research data. Actually, in our field, in computational chemistry, traditionally, uh, we were uh, asked uh, to include in the supporting information of our papers the X, Y, Z coordinates of all the atoms in the system, plus energies, plus other numerical values uh, that we generate. So the research data that we generate. In the past, I'm saying it was uh, hidden in hundreds of PDF pages included in the supporting information files. And with IOCAM BD, you can transform this into a single link, a DOI uh, reference uh, that brings directly to the database and users and other scientists can access our resource data. And uh, this arrives at a point uh, that all the world also, uh, you know, we are talking about management of resource data. Uh, we are talking about data management plans. Open science uh, arrive uh, with uh, strong effects in all our administrations and even in specific policies. Yeah. And uh, I think that you all know what's the mess with this with this uh, with this field. It's not a mess, and I very much like uh, your title, "Challenge of Chance." I do think it's a chance. It's a, at least it's a big opportunity for IOCAM now, huh? and also for uh, uh, everything involved in data management. Huh? It's a great opportunity to properly digitalize this part of the research. Hmm? So, uh, say that we finally have identified different needs, both in our labs, but also in companies. And the problem to share the data, to search for data that we produced in the past, to store data and store it properly and uh, to 
safe storage in also in, a, in any case. And also with the, having the data, it's important to have tools to easily be analyze and visualize the data. And today, maybe the most important uh, word is fair. Uh, everything is fair uh, in research, it has to be fair. Uh, and these are these four concepts uh, that uh, uh, we need uh, that our data to accomplish. And IOCAM is a solution for that, uh, for all these problems, and is oriented, uh, as I'm saying, to the computational chemistry field. Uh, so it allows to reduce storage, it allows to organize the data, and then it's very easy to retrieve, and what's more important, to generate new data-driven research, uh, to reuse the data, profit the data, and it's also important uh, to adopt standards. Uh, so the data now in CML, uh, it's perfectly tag, uh, and then this is a standard. And well, this, pipe, this drawing here is the pipeline, the data flows, uh, since we produce the data, since to finally end up with the uh, data published into a paper. We will go later on this uh, on this scheme, uh, but say it uh, in general words that uh, IOCAM BD can manage data in private mode, but also in public mode, in open access mode. It's already a mature platform. We have more than 10 years experience running the platform, so many, many bugs have been solved. Uh, new bugs appear every day, but uh, the, the platform is stable and used by many users uh, in many uh, universities around the world. And also we have started having uh, uh, agreements with companies, uh, what makes us very proud of the platform and very excited about the project. Yeah? So actually we started uh, more than 10 years ago and, uh, and we set up uh, what uh, we say the two main modules of the platform. One module that is called Create and is used to work in with the data in private manner. And the other module, which is called Browse, which is the module where the data goes when we want to make it public. Uh, when we publish the data, the data flows from the private closed world to the open world Browse. Mm? And this is managed by uh, uh, an identity, a central authentication system, so we have users, passwords, etc. Mm? And the architecture, so the, the architecture of the platform is quite uh, sophisticated, so it's a Java uh, software uh, with different databases and services uh, and uh, everything connected, encrypted, that is safe, etc. Mm? And uh, later, in 2017, we set up what we call the main service, or we call it the fine module that is hosted in the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. As a timeline, uh, you see that uh, in the last three, four years, we have had a lot of activity. Uh, IOCAM BD is, uh, open, is uh, open source code and can be installed on premise and uh, also in some cloud services, although the cloud services is supported by a commercial version of the, of the software. Uh, in the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, we have a node there, and actually there are more than 500 users uh, from around the world using this, our service. And uh, we have agreements, as I was saying, with some companies and also with uh, some uh, publishers uh, that uh, recommend uh, our platform uh, as a per repository uh, to uh, upload the supporting information files. So uh, at present, we are launching version 3 uh, this last month which implies major improvements in many aspects of the platform, in database structure, in many bugs, many new tools, and most importantly, in the facilities for searching data by chemical substructure and so on. 
it's a kind of joke eh, that in 2020, eh, this is just in pandemics, if I still remember, eh, that the, those memories was in pandemics where we start working the hardest. Eh, it looks like that. But is that true? This is when we uh, release version two, that was the first open source version. And immediately a Japanese company contacted us and uh, we started uh, agreements with them and developing uh, what we call also today the commercial version of IOCMPD. Uh, IOCAM is a network of nodes. You can, anyone, any academic institution can install its own nodes with browse and create modules. And at present, we have, of course, here in Tarragona, but also in other places in Spain and also in Canada or even in Denmark or in Poland. Yeah. And thanks to a project with the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, we can host there the central services and offer service for free to the academic community. We have just renewed this project for the next five years and uh, also host uh, what we call the central uh, node of our network. Hmm? We have uh, this is uh, the distribution of users around the world, and we are happy that we can paint many countries uh, with our color. So it's being accepted by the international community. And of course, since we are giving service for free, uh, this is uh, quite popular. Yeah. So let me now uh, go to show you the different modules and what uh, they do. Uh, and uh, basically, this is the uh, what we say the data pipeline that goes from data production to generate open data. And for doing that, we have these three modules. And the first one is create, uh, what we call create. And create is the private area, is what we say the entry point. It's like a single web app or desktop, desktop app that uh, you use to upload you can use to upload the data, to organize the data, uh, to generate some reports and also to process a little bit uh, some of the results. And it's very user friendly, very easy to use, as you will show later. And importantly, it has uh, two other ways to interact with the, that database, which is via a shell client, a Linux shell client, and also via the REST API interface. Actually, uh, Moises will show you, who will yeah, will present a demo uh, on how to use the shell client to automatize, for instance, yeah, uploading uh, very large data collections, uh, and is uh, ideal for scripting. Uh. And uh, at the end of the talk, uh, Diego will also show you some utilities of the REST app interface. This is how create looks like uh, it's a simple interface in the left uh, you see here projects and the calculations uh, you can organize the data by folders by projects by calculation types it's very easy to move the data from one place to another yeah and in the right we uh, automatically can uh, visualize the 3d structure of the system some general metadata and also build the results, we will visualize many properties. These are some examples of uh, screenshots you can obtain within Create. Uh, so we visualize from molecules, say, to periodic systems and surfaces, but also can handle by molecules. And we can get uh, different kinds of, uh, of plots of molecular structures, spectroscopies, reaction networks, uh, which is the latest and important part we are developing, and precisely Diego will talk about that at the end of the talk. So uh, this is basically create, and as I was saying, there is a shell client that Moises will explain to you later, and uh, an IPA interface as well. Then once uh, you have finished your project, all the data in Create is well tagged, is well uh, organized. Uh, you have added the, made, the necessary metadata, 
and comments and all you think is necessary, then the next step is to publish the data. And this is what the browse module uh, performs. It's very easy because this is just uh, pushing a button uh, that you move the data from create to browse. Uh, so publishing is just pushing the button. And then you move, uh, we move the data to this, uh, what you call this is the real open repository. Uh, this is uh, uh, what's really called a digital repository. It's based on DSpace uh, to manage uh, electronic documents. And it's, uh, we adapted DSpace a little bit uh, to our purposes and also offer connections via the APA and so on. And this is a much flat uh, uh, website. That is, for instance, what we see in our institution. Uh, this is the, the Bros server at ICAQ. Uh, and you see here you may have uh, uh, the users group by communities or research groups, uh, and then automatic uh, statistics uh, visualize its time. Mm? This is finally how we see the different entries. Uh, it's flat and plain. Uh, but for instance, uh, you can see here uh, title of a paper. This is the DOI. So, so this is the title of this collection. This is the DOI of this collection. And here we added sorry, the abstract of the paper. And then here we say this data set that results are published in, that was published in that paper. Oops, sorry. And this is the DOI of the paper. Uh, so in the paper, we included a supporting information, the DOI of the collection of the data set, data set. And now in the collection in the data, we include the DOI of the paper. So the circuit gets closed. Uh, publishing, as we are academics, uh, uh, can follow the same uh, pathway that the manuscript uh, follows. So we may embargo the data while the paper is under reviewing and can provide uh, special links for the reviewers uh, that they can even access the data and the embargo data. When the paper is uh, finally accepted for publication, we release the embargo and all the data gets published finally in the central server that we call it FINE. Hmm? This uh, central server uh, uh, is fed by the distributed nodes, by the different IOCAM nodes that may exist in the network, and that we have uh, approved them uh, to publish the, the data in IOCAM. And uh, while we publish the data, we do more things with, uh, with the data precisely for info. For instance, we generate uh, smiles and inchi keys in other metadata that is used then to index in the database. And this is a very fast uh, search engine uh, implemented on the Apache Solar and the RD frameworks. And uh, is so uh, what we will go to visit uh, first. Basically, this is the main page of the iocamdd.org. And this is the picture yesterday. So this is the central service. There are seven nodes in our network, more than 700 data sets have been already published and hundreds of thousands of uh, different items. Hmm? Well, so this is uh, the, the workflow hmm? from the different uh, codes. Uh, we can end up with a paper accepted. And when the paper and the data is published, so all the community uh, say can access freely the data. Hmm? But what's uh, interesting, and this is what's beyond IOCAM, is the different tools we can uh, develop uh, while having the data in private form as well. Uh, and this is interesting tools, as I will show you. So one first uh, thing that we can do with the data when it's published in IOCAM. So is, for instance, to include some links and, for instance, 
3D molecular structures directly into a manuscript. And this was a project uh, that uh, the International Journal of Quantum Chemistry started some time ago with, uh, uh, with uh, Authorea, uh, that was a kind of uh, online uh, editing uh, application uh, to write the paper directly in, uh, in the pla in, uh, Wiley platform and include live data from IOCAM. Hmm? Talking more about the tools, uh, there are many things you can do with the data. Okay, nowadays, uh, first thing is to create databases of special properties, for instance, and uh, we are working on a polyoxomethylates database that will be published soon in IOCAM. And also other people is working in databases, for instance, this project called SEPIA, this is uh, SEPIA is in Spanish and it's an acronym in Spanish of Environmental Impact Prediction Expert System and it's a database of uh, 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 molecular species involved in uh, agrochemicals and pesticides and fertilizers and so huh? and uh, a colleague from the University Autonoma of Madrid have developed uh, a computational method uh, that based on the computational results that I store in our database uh, can predict the, 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 the or want to predict the environmental impact of uh, those systems. In, the, in my group, we are now developing many tools uh, with the data in IOCAM, of course, and uh, I will only mention uh, Home Simulator is a ambitious project to simulate the multi-species, multi-equilibria processes in polyoxymethylates. Then we also did something about it. Uh, we are doing some, wanted to, yeah. Machine learning is a, a big uh, asset today in any case, uh, and this is data driven, of course. And uh, what we think is uh, really new and also much more, very interesting uh, for us is uh, to work uh, in uh, re chemical reactivity in catalytic cycles. This is only, this is also the main, one of the main activities and goals of the Institute. And precisely together with Diego Garay, uh, we will close the session today. We have developed uh, an ontology, a new ontology, to deal with uh, reaction networks. And we will explain to you this in detail. And also other tools uh, to uh, work with catalytic cycles and reaction networks. And, and part of these tools can be very easily connected with IOCAM. Uh, so, as concluding re remarks of this uh, first part of my talk, I would just uh, say that IOCAM is a digital repository. Uh, it's used to manage research data in computational chemistry field. Uh, it's already a mature platform and it's very stable and it's be being used by many users around the world, also us, of course. And uh, we think that there is a lot beyond, uh, as you will see later, especially with Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be all from my part. Just uh, wanted to thank the team, uh, the team involved in uh, IOCAM, especially Moises, uh, is our uh, software engineer. And then uh, this year we have uh, incorporated Jair Wells. Jair is a product developer and his goal is uh, to push IOCAM uh, towards being a company. Uh, we want to create a company and we think that uh, we will succeed and Jair is in charge of all this. Then Mark Gruber, this is a very young software engineer that uh, together with uh, Diego, uh, managing this process, this um, 
uh, developing this project, uh, it's called Data for Materials, Data for Match, and it's precisely what Diego will introduce you at the end of the, of the talk. This is iochembd.org, and this is uh, what is what we say the file, the central repository, and it's hosted by the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Uh, so this is uh, the web page of this project uh, that shows you a, a little bit what iochem is, uh, some video tutorials and demos, and uh, so it's a plain website. Importantly, there are lots of documentation in the website and also from here you can uh, also download the software if you want to test the the open source version uh, very easily even with docker a docker image uh, you can set up the software running in your laptop uh, in minutes uh. if you want to set up uh, a node on official IOCAM node, you can download the, the even the binary package, and uh, we will support you in setting up the node and in connecting the node to the network. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, if you wanted to use IOCAM uh, offered by the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, you just fill this form and we will send you a user and uh, how to access your user account. And then what uh, this central platform has uh, is the possibility to search uh, to all data, which is indexed and stored in this database. Then, for instance, uh, we can search, I don't know, fullerines. We can search by text here, fullerines, and automatically all we Text we have indexed are uh, offered here as possible answers in the different fields that uh, contain the data, yeah? in, the meta, in the metadata as well. Or you go to something more technique, 631, this is a basis set that is used in quantum chemistry calculations, and you can find automatically very quickly uh, possible uh, answers to your query. We are quite proud about uh, this search by substructure that now is also implemented in CREATE. And here, just live, uh, we can search the database and over 300,000, 300, more than 300,000 entries. Uh, you have seen how fast we find possible 9,000. This is a similarity, uh, but uh, it goes quite fast. We can go to see the results and see what we found. Okay. And indeed, we find here multi ring or some big ring, some structures with big rings, uh, not exactly, uh, but it's similar to the thing we have drawn. Okay. Uh... If we go to an entry, oh, this is from Maria, it's okay. Let's see. We go to this entry. Hmm. Should answer. We see the full hmm, entry, the full data of this of this single calculation. Hmm. It's also published, that was published in Organometallics. Uh, we have here the 3D structure, okay? Some metadata that we included. And if we go to, we can download, when we say the geometry is I, X, Y, Z coordinates, that directly, yeah? But also you can download all the files that have been included in this, uh, in this collection. Uh, and we always keep the input file used to run that calculation and or uh, the output file translated to CML language. And if you want to see the data, we see here, uh, this is a Gaussian calculation. 
yeah, the coordinates optimize when we capture the data we check it whether that was a geometry optimization process or not and these are uh, optimized geometries with the basis set and then uh, this different info energies this is energy that was captured and then have here more uh, more energies after the frequencies calculation and even for the infrared spectrum we can visualize the vibrational modes yeah? and also different electric properties that were computed so depending on the kind of uh, calculation and the kind of code different properties are captured uh, from the output files in general, eh, we capture the most common data that uh, users uh, use, uh, actually. And it's relatively easy yeah, to, to modify uh, this part, uh, so to include new data uh, in our database. Mm, here in the docs, in the user manual, I want to go there to see two things. First, uh, yeah, have, have this feature matrix where we have the list of the different codes that we support today. As you can see, uh, most of the most common quantum chemistry codes and DFT, but also molecular dynamics. Classical molecular dynamics, amber, gromax, lamps, but also VASP and quantum espresso for materials. So the list is not complete, but it starts being long. And uh, what does I was saying? Eh? Not for all uh, format types, eh? we, we support the same properties. Eh? There are some properties that are supported only in some codes uh, but here you have uh, if you are more interested here you have the information to check it hmm? and but, um, yeah so this is the the the, the website uh, the user with the user guides and uh, some uh, also information to downloading and to install the platform yeah and actually this is uh, under renovation uh, we are building a new website for uh, the product uh, say and to explain the clear differences between the open source version for academics yeah, and the commercial version for academics or for companies as well yeah and uh, let me show you how the, all this works so we can go to the main page and now I will jump to IOCAM at ICATU so to my IOCAM or our IOCAM running here and this when you enter when you arrive here what you see is the different research groups that are using the platform and some uh, statistics, latest statistics of uh, the contents of the database. And we see here all the data that has been published. What's not, what has not been published is still private. Okay, As here you see only, uh, maybe everything is not uh, actualized. Uh, but you see here only published data. You, we can sing in and go to the private module, create, for instance. Here I will use this user with a given password to log in into our create module. Yeah? And we see here that it is version 3. Now we are running the, the latest version already. And uh, you can see here yeah, that uh, we see folders uh, with uh, 
calculations that uh, included here, there, that was uh, IDF calculations. But then here you may found some Gaussian calculations. Yeah. And you see here, uh, so in, the, in this left side, uh, we can navigate uh, through our collections uh, and easily visualize at least uh, the 3D structure of that uh, of that system yeah same here uh, if we if we want to build the results uh, we can access the data that you really store and same as before uh, we before we visualize this data in browse now we are visualizing data in create and you may recognize the format uh, so this kind of uh, format uh, to visualize the data uh, and is common among the different modules uh, and also common among the different kind of codes. Yeah? Uh, another interesting thing you can do in Create is search, search uh, in all our private data actually, mm -hmm. the private data in our institution. And we can search by smiles, by inchi, or just also by subtraction again. And let's see if we, I can find some uh, calculations with uranium. It's an exotic atom. Do we work with uranium? Yes, I know. And this is very simple. Yeah? Just to show you that I can search by a Exotic smiles, in this case, no? and indeed I found some calculations, one by me, another by a, by a collection by a, a student, Enric Petrus, no? where he was working in complicated, no? in this case, complex uranium polyoxymethylate clusters, in this case, uranium and niobium, by the way. Okay, we can uh, search uh, the more chemical data, no? for instance, we work a lot with, uh, with uh, carbonates, cyclic carbonates. Let's see, we found some similar no? contains, or oh, exact, no, I want to find some exact. Let's see if it, uh, the search engine. No, the search engine sometimes doesn't work perfectly. It contains this. Let's see. We found some cyclic carbonate. Indeed, uh, from my some of my students, Alba Villar, uh, she's working on activation of CO2 to form cyclic carbonates, and also some other member in my group also work in these topics uh, and we can uh, easily extract mm, in this case calculation from five years ago well, which is not bad yeah it's uh, the way to keep our project running okay and finally the same thing too long finally let me show you what we call reports reports is a way to make sub collections of a collection mm, and uh, basically the one that we're interested the most is in reaction energy profile reports and uh, this is uh, for instance uh, one of these examples uh, where we can select a set of calculations and then identify them in the reaction network and generate very easily uh, reaction energy profile. Uh, we can combine the different profiles in the same plotting, uh, which is, is uh, very useful to analyze uh, catalytic uh, cycles and... Uh, oh, I went out. Catalytic cycles and uh, reaction networks. Whoops, I... So reports, uh, for instance, uh, you can use these to compare different methods and it's very 
simple and very easy to do. And this actually uh, uh, accelerates research, say. Uh, so uh, this data is captured automatically from the auto files and then is combined automatically uh, without human intervention. Uh, so we are minimizing here lots of uh, human mistakes. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, uh, this is, is simple, but Diego will tell you a little bit more. Uh, from the reaction profile, uh, we can uh, generate uh, a reaction network very easily. Uh, in this case, this uh, does not make sense. Uh, but Diego will show you more useful uh, examples later. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is all from my part. Yeah. Thanks uh, a lot. And uh, if you have uh, any comment or any question, I will be happy to answer. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Carl. I have meanwhile found a quiet place here on the on the conference. Are there any questions or remarks? Ah, there is Vasya. Please go ahead. So thanks for this presentation. I'm now eager to use IOCAM BED. And I would like to know how much metadata is mandatory to give? I think in order to really reuse data, you would need to know, for example, convergence thresholds or how fine your integration grid in DFT was and so on. So is is any user forced to give all that or is this an optional additional data? Yes, yeah, it's, it's optional. Uh, so the, the, the basic metadata is something uh, core, called the Dublin core. And this takes care of the owner of the data, of the license of the, of the data, and then the date, uh, time when, uh, when that was created, institutions, and, and so on. Uh, we insist uh, our users uh, to include comments. Uh, so more than metadata, comments around the data so put in context that calculation a little bit, uh, what the project was about, uh, a little bit more text, uh, like having that text, uh, then when we index all the data, metadata and text, uh, we get uh, uh, good information, say, in, in that case. Yeah. Okay, but this is kind of me being nice when writing all of this data into the comments. I don't have to if I don't want. Can I ask one more question? Yes, please. Yes. Um, on, on one slide, you show you, you give data from programs like Gaussian, Turbomod, and so on. But uh, there was also an arrow giving this data back to the programs. Could I um, easily input structures from IOCMBD into further Gaussian calculations? Yeah, we do that uh, using uh, scripts or workflows or Python. Yeah, we actually we set up uh, this uh, uh, workflow system uh, that carry very easily. Uh, can, uh, you can program a way to extract data from IOCAM process the data, submit calculations, and then once the calculations finish, upload directly and automatically again into IOCAM. Very cool. Uh, so okay, this, uh, actually, actually, this I uh, think that I don't know if Diego will talk a little bit about that, but uh, it's also what uh, what he's doing. Yeah. So as Carla said, I will talk a little bit about the PHL module. And this is, to, this is a tool that we will use in command line to handle the most relevant uh, actions in the create module, like creating hierarchies of projects, like uploading calculations, managing them, also deleting them if you want. And it's done like this. Let me start. We will log in. 
shader in the right upper menu bar you will see an option that allows you to download the shell client okay and it will download a shell zip file that we can extract wherever we want in this case we will use the desktop and it contains all the files necessary to to uh, use the the shell client bundles uh, have a, a runtime environment so there is no dependencies at all so if we get into the, the downloaded uh, so if you see at the content of the package you will see that there are uh, some scripts some uh, binary files and the more relevant ones is the one that start the connection with the create server that is run using the dot command or source one and the start prep shell okay if you want to uh, previously be, before we start using the shell client it is interesting to define a, a variable in the path so we can run our shell client uh, anywhere in our machine so it's better to do, to do this export so we will happen to our current path the path to the shell client okay and also happen to the existing path so with it, with that we can run our startup shell command anywhere. Okay. First time we do it, uh, it will request our credentials to the server. With the same credentials, we will log in. Uh, we, it will make the login and generate a session cookie that will uh, will last forever unless we doesn't reset the service. We don't have to log in again. Okay or we are booking also and once uh, it has connected it adds uh, several comments that i will try to explain most of them all but the most relevant ones okay once we have done this uh, we have the pwd pro that is the same that pwd is spring working directory but this is the same for uh, create that will list where we are right now okay this is the base path of our workspace. Okay, this is uh, at the DB, and the, this is the, our username. As you can see in the create in the create module, you will see that when you are not selecting any project, you are always you are always located in the in the base of the workspace. Okay. So once we are located here, we can uh, use another uh, handy tool that is create project that we will use, we'll use to create the first one, this project. So we set parameters like N with the name, and set the set, and the description. Sample test. You can see, just when we have set this, it has appeared, our first project, okay? It's quite fast. So, if you don't know how the column goes, you can always ask the minus H and it will explain the mandatory uh, parameters and anything that you need to run this command. And uh, when we have created, we can move to that uh, project using the next command CD Pro. In this case, we will say, set the name of the project we want to move to this set. You will see that the PWD Pro tells you that you are in the tested uh, folder or project. It's like you have selected it and you have the same path here. Now, you, if you upload any calculation, it will be uploaded into this location. Okay. Let's try it. Let's go to upload a calculation. We have several uh, calculations here. We can choose one from here, for example. We have several. We can choose, for, for example, for Gaussian. No. We will try for Gaussian, for example. We will try with propine. Okay. So once we are in our project, we use the utility command. There is one for each uh, supported format, in the task, okay? And each one has also 
is poor and help is all the parameters that must be provided to load the calculation. In this case, we need the minus i with the, the input file, minus o with the output file. We need also the name and the description. So we will do our else. Set the input file. This is a com. And let me set the same name and description. Okay. When doing this, uh, it downloads the capturing templates and parses the file and generates the CMR file. What it does is uploads the input file, uh, the entire input file, and the CMR converted file to the server. Okay. It doesn't take too long. Okay, now you can see that our calculation is history. It's quite direct. You can see the results and all the data that uh, Professor Carlos Bo has already talked about. Okay. Uh, being here, we can um, do more examples with some of the calculations just to check. Yeah. And we'll write another one. What? Let's see, it fills requires. In this case, ADF is, is the same as, as Gaussian, only requires input file, output file, description, and name. Okay, so let's do it. is NM. Set the name and the description. And the same. It retrieves all the it has been pretty fast. It retrieves the capturing templates, it processes the, the calculation, converts it to CMM and uploads. Okay. You can see, for example, the generated files. This is the input file that we have uploaded, and the output file in CML. Okay, you can see all the calculation and how it has been converted. Okay. Perfect. If we choose another type of calculation, let's say, for example, VAS. In this case, we have a model for our dynamics. Uh, we will use the load BASP script, and in this case, the parameters change a little because there are other type of calculations. You can uh, not, we can upload F files, elastic band, and, and dimmer calculations, and also the normally it, it states the the required calcul the, the required calculation files. But for example, as input file, it requires the inker by default and outcard files. And you can also attach as additional files uh, the Doscar file and the Kaplan file. Okay, so we can use Plotbasp, the Inca, the Outcar, with the Oscar, exist, yes, the points, and as name, let's say, Dynamics, and uh, the same as description. It can take some more time. I mean, this is larger calculation. Has an average processing time of one megabyte per second, depending on the machine. We really recommend always to use the shell client because the CPU uh, used here is on your side, is on your machine, because you're, you're doing the conversion on your side, on your machine. Okay. If you load it via web, the, the web server has to do the, this task for you. Okay, so we have this dynamic, this is a carbon now view. You can see fields. Okay, the points, the energy. Okay, a bit of step and so a little bit here about the dynamic. Okay. Additionally, we, as a last example, we uh, can upload other kinds of calculations, as I said, uh, more cache files. 
let's check the mocas and in this case we will use the acrolane cassia foundation and in this case we check also more run molcas which is our acquire in this case it's like gaussian and adf is input file output file lemon description so let's do the mocas File. And as additional file, we will set this molded orbital file. Uh, it can be detect several uh, formats, and one of them is molded, so uh, it can um, upload and process these files and visualize them. The molded files, so you can choose visualize the selected orbitals for that calculation. Okay. It is also integrated in the reports. Can be also reviewed here. Okay. That's the active orbitals. This is a, an example of, of how the cell client have, can be used to uh, add calculations. Okay. This is quite, quite easy. Then, uh, consider that you have a, a really large uh, hierarchy and your calculations are located into a, to a series of or folders okay so you have to reproduce them by hand it's quite tedious uh, and error prone uh, solution so there is a flag when you do a, a an upload it's called minus minus auto and in this case it will generate the path for you so if you load a calculation for example that is located here and we use the load same. Okay. Let me know. Let's see. We are now here in the test set. We will move to the base. CD Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We are in the root of our workspace. And now we want to load this calculation, but we don't want to generate all the path. So we will use this. Sorry. Oh, oh, there is a mistake in the JavaScript. Okay, we will check in and report this back, <laughs> the back of the session. Let's check it with another calculation. Not a year. Auto. Yes, one frac. Description. Okay, it generates all the path with this flag. All the all the recursive folders until it generates in its proper in its proper uh, project. Okay, can be set with the with the, with the appropriate uh, parameter uh, home path. So if you define this variable the home path it will remove this this path from the generated path so you if you define the home path variable with the home malware at desktop and you run it again you will see that it has generated it has removed this path and has generated properly in its location okay this is quite handy when you do some scripting with it as an example if you want to script, for example, the blood of several calculations uh, that are inside a folder, and this one, for example, yes, or Gaussian, we can use uh, the batch scripting tools to do things like this. Find a script that performs first the, the login into the a shared client and then iterate each folder and for each folder we will find all the files that has uh, extension in and set each counterpart uh, without so we if we have the input file and the output file we can do uh, get into that folder and do a lot adf automatically with all these parameters and at the end disconnect 
what will this script do? So it will load automatically all the calculations that exist in, in, a, in a hierarchy of calculation, in a hierarchy of folders, okay? So I will move this to the shared client. And I put the F, sample, ADF multiple, will connect, and I start to bloating. As you can see, it's been detected and not bothered at all. Okay, no, this is the, the normal, the, it tries to generate some path that doesn't exist, so this is the normal, okay? We also can do the same, but with uh, mul multiple calculations stored in one folder, in calculation, for example. So we can script also in ORCA, but ORCA. What does the script do? It searches for input. Imp uh, files and set its old, uh, its counterpart input file and it connects and for each folder set uh, these calculations and if they exist it gets generated it's the same copy them to show client and we do the organ that has this structure okay have several calculations inside several folders. And do the local work and not here. And it will start processing all the oops, sorry. It's with the same structure. It's calculation inside. These are some common errors that must be hidden, but they, they work out. You can see the structure is, is the same. Okay. So, we can code it, put it down. So, uh, once you can create projects, we see project, you can move into that projects, you can load calculations into that projects, not bash, not Gaussian, and you can also uh, script it to upload this calculation. The final command is exit rep that disconnects from the from the server when you are done. Uh, these are not all the, the comments. You can review them, the documentation, but it's better explaining that I have done. And you can see here, loading content into create, you will see how to download the shell client, all the comments that you have available, the special uh, parameters and specific combinations, okay, the auto parameter, and also the finally the recursible block that you have seen with the calculation per folder, with the calculation per folder, and how to operate. Okay, this is more or less the, the basic uh, usage of the shell client. Okay, so if you have any questions, ask. I think that's, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? So I let, let me ask one. Uh, if you uh, would want to create a reaction profile, you would uh, like do that recursively over many folders and then uh, the program will generate the reaction profile for you or you need to do some extra steps? Uh, you need to do some extra steps. I think Diego knows more about this this topic. Okay. And use the 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 REST API or the shell client to download the information and generate the, the report. But okay. So then I'm gonna I'm gonna be patient and wait for that. <laughs> Thank you. Diego will will talk. Yeah, yeah, you can do it by hand. 
Uh, so we can create the, the profiles by hand. And right here we set up a graph editor. You can actually draw the reaction graph directly. Sounds good. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then let's hand over to Diego. Okay, this will be a, a quick overview and the rest of the, 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 the talk will be more practical, like with a couple of Jupyter notebooks to showcase these, um, these tools that we have been developing to work with IOCMB data in Python. But I wanted to showcase these slides just to make clear uh, what kind of data structures we are handling and how are we uh, retrieving our data from, from IOCMB actually. So, uh, the idea is that uh, we are taking the data, as Carles has also mentioned in his part of the talk, from with a REST API from IOCMBD. But the thing is that as we have these two more or less independent modules, so browse and create, browse which is public and create which is private, we have two independent REST APIs for the two modules. So, the one from create is currently uh, under development and is available in the ICIQ instance because we test it things uh, first here before releasing them to the rest of the community. But the REST API of Browse is currently public and any user can employ it to retrieve data from that which is public in Browse. So this is the thing that I'm going to be focusing more on this part of the talk. So the first thing I'm going to showcase is PyIOCAM, which is this uh, Python package that we have been developing to simplify the interaction of the user with this REST API. So this package does, does several things like uh, managing the HTML requests that we need to retrieve the data through the REST API. Also, it handles the automated download of all the files that are contained in a collection. So this can be the CML files that we have parsed in IOCMBD or the input or additional files that Moises has also mentioned. And it's important to note that we can also filter these files. We are not limited to downloading the whole collection at once, which can be a bit of a problem if the collection is very large, but we can specify different filters to only get those parts of the collection that we are interested in, for example, to reproduce a given study. And the final thing implemented in PyIOCAM is the possibility of extracting some fields from these CML files that IOCMBD produces. Because the CML file is an excellent standard for a, a chemical information, but it's not the most common format for the, mo for the majority of computational chemists. And there are some aspects that will be a bit uh, weird to, to handle, but just uh, opening the CML file and trying to extract this information. So the library also tries to simplify this part of the workflow and get important parts of the information of these CML files, like the geometry, the energies, and several other fields that I'm going to mention later. So, also, it's worth noting that uh, this package is open source and it's already available on GitLab. So, you may download and use it. And also, if somebody is interested in adding new capabilities, because this is, of course, a work still a work in progress, uh, feel free to, to try to collaborate and add new things to the package because that's the way forward in this kind of projects. The other thing I want to show is this other package named OnDirectSend Tools that is meant to apply a semantic organization scheme to the reaction networks stored in IOCMBD. Carles has already mentioned that we defined this ontology named OnDirectSend to deal with this data related to chemical reaction networks from computational results and uh, has also showcased and um, we have also mentioned this possibility of building reaction network graphs in the platform. So, what we do with this package is to bring all the information together and apply this organization scheme to the data available in IOCMBD. So, we can put all the information together in a single entity, which is what we call chemical reaction network knowledge graphs that have all the properties that have been parsed by IOCMBD and are available in the CML format, and also all the very important information about the reactivity of the network. So, which are the intermediates happening in a reaction mechanism and how they are connected. And therefore, we can use this a chemical reaction network knowledge graphs as a standard format for reaction networks to develop different kind of workflows that I will show to you now. So, also, just to finish the uh, static part of the presentation, also mentioned that the package is also available on GitLab and 
open source and of course open to collaboration for anyone interested. So enough from this uh, more um, traditional part. And now I will like to go through a couple of Jupyter notebooks. Hope everything is, uh, can be well uh, seen and the font size is appropriate. So I will go first with explaining the first package, of course, this by IOCAM for this a more direct and more simple interaction with IOCAM BD and with what Moises and Carlos have said. And then I will go a little bit on how do we create these chemical reaction network knowledge graphs and of course into why they can be interesting for a uh, computational chemists and for the scientific community as a way to make our science uh, more reproducible. So, first of all, starting with by IOCHEM, the idea is that it allows us to retrieve information from IOCHEM BD. And therefore, it provides us with connections to the uh, REST API of the, um, of, the crea of the create and of the browse module, which is the one I'm going to focus uh, right now. So, um, the things we need to do this is, of course, to import the package as expected in Python. And then we need to tell the program which is the collection that we are interested in. So to do this, uh, we can. I have selected this example, which is the unimolecular composition of indole. It's a, a set of calculations that I we carried out and that I have uploaded in my own IOCHEM, and they are published because this paper is already published. So the thing is that we take this handle, this unique identifier. For, uh, that refers to the collection, which is a kind of internal identifier used by IOCMBD, and which is the thing that we will use to connect to the REST API and connect to this uh, specific collection. So from the program side, we just need to uh, create this object with a pretty long, but I think self-explanatory name, so a public collection handler, and we uh, tell the handle, so this unique identifier for the collection that we are connecting to, we tell that it's happening on the browse service and not on create, and also that it's happening on the ICIQ node, because this was these were calculations that I uploaded myself, so they are in the ICIQ instance. However, this will work just the same for a collection in the public node in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center or in other instances, just by uh, calling the appropriate uh, names for the REST API. So from here, we can um, uh, try to get the whole collection of items uh, um, embedded in the network. So we call this get item div, again, pretty self-explanatory. Here we have a couple of parameters to limit the number of calculations that we ask for at once, just to uh, avoid overloading the server, or if, especially if we were handling very large collections with possibly thousands of items, which wouldn't be nice to try to get all of them at once. So we get this dictionary of items where we have this handle. Each collection has a handle, but also its individual item in the collection has its own handle. And also we have the name of the calculation in the collection, as we can see here, which is something more friendly probably to the chemist that is doing this kind of work. So then we have this whole and um, quite long hierarchy of elements. We have a total of 102 calculations here. But another thing I mentioned before is that we may not be interested in all the calculations at once, but only in a subset of them. So what we are doing here is to filter the collection and only select with a conditional the handles that correspond to the part of the collection that we were interested in. A common way to do this will be just to look at the names of the calculations and so on. Here it's a bit more complex because the collection was not so well organized, so a problem on my side when <laughs> preparing the calculations, and I have done another kind of filtering, but the procedure will be the same. We just send in the way in which we write this condition here. So we are getting a list with the handles from this uh, large list of calculations that we are accepting. And here is where we uh, do the actual work of trying to retrieve the actual files from IOCMBD. So again, another self-explanatory function, which is called getCML files. And the idea is we target just this output.cml file that uh, Mo uh, Moises and Carles have shown to be part of the calculate of the uh, files that are available in IOCMBD. We could also target, for example, the input or traditional files, but not, we want the CML. 
we tell the function in which a local directory we want to save the information, and we post our list of valid handles to actually filter the results. So you should have seen that this uh, kept appearing, uh, seeming that uh, meaning that the calculations were being downloaded, and in the end, from this collection, we have retrieved a total of 72 calculations, which are the ones we are going to work with uh, from now. But uh, as we save the files to um, uh, leverage that IOCMPD assigns this kind of unique identifiers and handles, we are saving the calculations with names that are related to the handle, which is unique, but it's not too human friendly to then try to uh, remember that calculation um, uh, 35,024 was the indole molecule, for example. So we also keep a track of the files that we have downloaded and we are uh, saving it in this list that we may now uh, save to a file, for example, which is what we are doing now. And that has this mapping between the name of, well, between the uh, identifier of the calculation and the name. So we, again, are able to keep track of which calculation, which of these CML files corresponds to what part of our mechanistic study or the reaction network. So this is the information that we have generated and we have finished it with this part of getting data from IOCMBD. But of course, the question here is why do we want to retrieve the data from IOCMBD if it's already stored and it's already accessible in the platform? The answer will probably be because we want to do things with this data and probably things that we won't be able to do just with the uh, tools on the web interface of IOCMBD. For example, we are interested in looking at uh, some property of all the calculations at once or to do some, some, of, some kind of plotting, some kind of analysis, or maybe further calculations. So what we will do now is to go through this collection that we have just downloaded and try to extract information from it. So we will use another part of Pi IOCM package, which is called CML2Pi, and that gives us a, a simple way to retrieve some of the most relevant fields from the uh, CML format to a more uh, user-friendly uh, way, and a way which is more in line with how computational chemists, we usually work with information. So this, as I have mentioned before, so this is a work in progress. This is not targeting yet all the numerous uh, fields and properties that I captured by IOCMPD, but the idea is to keep this, uh, keep extending this as we go and as we need it, because it will be a bit of a daunting task to put all of this in the library at, at the same time. So again, work in progress, but it already has some of the most important fields. So we are reading back this mapping between the calculation names and the CML files, just to make things uh, more trackable for us. And then we are going through all these entries, so through all these calculations and names, to be able to eventually use this function uh, from CML to Py to parse the CML format. So by running this, we have a brief list of all the properties that are currently available from the library. Again, this is a list that needs uh, extending, but we will be working with this in the future. But we already have some of the most relevant uh, properties for a computational chemistry. Uh, now, for example, we are targeting the geometry of the molecule, so the optimized uh, geometry that the calculation found. Also, the electronic energy and the Gibbs free energy which are some fields that in almost every mechanistic study we will be interested in. So what we do here is to uh, go through these geometries that we are extracting and save them as XYZ files, which is a more common format that will be easier to adapt to uh, for their processing or to send these calculations to a colleague or collaborator to do further analysis. And apart from the geometries, uh, we are also saving the and the electronic and gives free energy in a list. So from here, we can take this list of energies. In this uh, cell, we are just saving things to a file. So we have a CSV file that we can open with our spreadsheet program of choice. For example, we don't want to do a more 
traditional data manipulation, but we can also work with the values in the same bifurcation session that we are working now. So we have this data frame that already has all the molecules in our uh, collection and the corresponding electronic and gift free energies in case we want to compute, for example, their relative energies and the feasibility of a given part of the process. Uh, coming back to the idea of geometries, we have saved these XYZ files. So we made open all of these structures in our uh, molecular visualizer of choice. But to wrap things up a bit and finish this uh, part of the presentation, it will be nice to also have the geometries in the same Jupyter notebook. So we are uh, keeping to this philosophy of having all the information in one place. So we're just using the atomic simulation uh, environment, ASE, this library to work with molecules in Python to do a very quick visualization of the geometries that we have saved as XYZ files. So we can display here, this is called minimum two and corresponds to the molecule of indole, which was the starting point of this decomposition study. So we get access to the geometry that was optimized and was stored in IOCHEM and we have parts from the CML file. And we can also look at other uh, geometries in our uh, system, like here, for example, hydrogen cyanide, which apart from poison is one of the decomposition process products of our reaction network. And I have mentioned now uh, an important concept um, a couple of times, which is the idea of uh, that we are working with a reaction network. And we have finished with this part of uh, taking data from IOKIM and working with it. But I think here we find, uh, or this is where we found an issue, or not an issue, but a limitation of the methodology that we wanted to tackle. And it was that at this point, we have a lot of information about the individual calculations. We have the XYZ files, we have this uh, table with all the energies so important parts of the process, but we did not have all the knowledge that we have about our system, because here we have all these tags, all these names and energies, but we don't know uh, how these different molecules are connected. If we take this transition state here, for example, we do not know which two intermediates are being connected by this transition state. If we wanted to compute the relative energies, uh, we do not know um, how to combine the fragments that happen along the network to get the energies of the two fragments, two associated fragments that we need to properly define a step of the process. So we are missing the most chemical part of the information, which is uh, the actual reactivity, which reactions are happening in the system. And a uh, part of the solution comes with this aspect that uh, uh, Carles and Moises have already mentioned, which is this definition of reaction network graphs. These are the new functionality of the new graph editor that Carles was mentioning uh, before as an answer to one of the questions. That is something that has been recently added by uh, Moises and our other colleague, Mark. So here we have um, a way to visualize the reaction network linked to the calculations that are available in IOCMBD. So we can modify these, add connections, and really put all the information together. So we do not only have the properties that have been uh, compute with individual calculations and have been stored in IOCMPD, but we also have this more chemical part that tells us how all of these individual calculations are related. And to keep bringing this uh, forward and wrap things up a bit more is why we developed this uh, idea of chemical reaction network knowledge graphs using this ontology on the extent to organize the information. So to express the different kinds of entities that we need to uh, talk about this kind of systems and to manage this kind of systems and the relationships that exist between these different entities. So we have a kind of framework to organize the information and take all this data available in IOCMBD, so the collection with the individual properties and also the chemical reaction network that we had defined in our graph editor. And we put this together in terms of the ontology to build this very highly connected knowledge graph. And the nice thing about the knowledge graph is that it contains all the information that we need about the system. It's a self-contained database that has everything about all that we know about the chemistry of this uh, particular study. And therefore, it can be a standard format to work more with this um, uh, 
uh, with this reaction network and prepare different kinds of workflows or data processing schemes that only need this knowledge graph as a data source. So, first things first, how do we create a knowledge graph from IOCMBD? Indeed, this is a, a pretty simple process. We just need to import this onto our Xen uh, tools uh, library that handles this uh, knowledge graph creation. And we need to, as before we needed the handle of the collection, here we need the identifier of the report, which is uh, here in the same window where we defend report. We have this unique identifier that will allow us to use the REST API to grab all this information from IOCMBD. It's also important to note that this uh, currently is happening in the create module, so this module that is private. So we also need to have an account and have our login information. This was not necessary for browse because the data is open, but now we are taking data that might be, or at least by definition, private and that only the user can access. So with the ID of the report and these login details, we can just call this function here Again, pretty self-explanatory, no less graph generation. So what we do is to pass the report and the login details, uh, and this handles the whole process. It gets the individual CML files associated to our collection, but now it's getting it from create instead of from browse. And also we are, we retrieve all these files and create this uh, knowledge graph file, which is in the old format and it's organized as a collection of RDF trifles. Not to be too, uh, too detailed on this, but the thing is that we are organized, reorganizing the information to have together, again, the network topology, so the reactions and individual properties that we have computed. And we can see that this has finished. It has fetched the 72 files that were related to this reaction network, which of course it's the same that we have done with browse because we are keeping the same example, and we have created this uh, reaction network graph that has 36 different nodes and 40 different edges. And it has been created as a knowledge graph with all the information. In principle, this could also be done with the results from Bros because we are again um, getting the CML files, but Bros doesn't have yet the capability of defining uh, chemical reaction networks. So we will need to express the networks externally and it will be a bit more problematic. But the idea is that in the future, we will add these reaction graph reports to the browse module so we can all publish the, um, the graphs to the module and this procedure is available for anyone. So this is a work in progress, but it should be available in the future to again, keep on uh, building on this uh, reproducibility and for data parting. So at this point, I think the main question left to answer is, is why we want to do this, which are the advantages of having chemical reaction network knowledge graphs as a format to work with our uh, reaction networks. And the answer is something that I have already mentioned indeed. So it was already answered is that we can use this as a standard format to automate different procedures and uniformize the always difficult task of retrieving organizing and manipulating data. Here we can use the SparkQL querying language, which is not very, very widely known, but it, in terms of syntax is very similar to SQL for traditional databases, which you will probably most familiar with. And the idea is that we can use this language, this querying language to ask questions to the knowledge graph and get only the parts of this very information rich knowledge graph that actually answer our questions or in other sense, fulfill our conditions and therefore give us the information that we need to work with this chemical system. So to make things clearer, I will show a working example here. Uh, again, still with the in all the composition example that I have already showcased. So the idea here is that instead of seeing uh, individual table of energies or individual geometries, we want to build the reaction network graph that show us how these different species are connected. But also to make it clearer for us, we also want that every node, every intermediate in the network graph uh, shows the corresponding to the uh, molecular structure of the molecule of fragment corresponding to that state. So we get an immediate idea of how the um, uh, disassembly process or the, the composition process of indole is happening. And also because we have the energies, we will show 
together with this to the representation, the corresponding relative gives free energy to showcase how feasible or how unfeasible the process is. So the idea is to have a workflow that builds this kind of visualization, which I think is a useful visualization that gives us all the key mechanistic information of the system at a glance and does this automatically for a chemical reaction network knowledge graph. So the idea is that we do this effort once for this specific system, but as we are using this standardized format with a, a CR and KE, we can then reutilize or transfer this workflow to any other system that we have characterized. So it really, in the long time, it saves us a lot of time because the workflows can be reutilized over and over again. So the code I'm going to showcase uh, from now on can be a bit convoluted and, and it's not as compact as the previous one. And this is made due to two main reasons. First is that to build this um, 2D molecular representations, we are using RDKit, which is a very powerful library, but sometimes can be a bit verbose and a bit convoluted to do some operations. And the other thing is that we need to write the explicit queries that we want to uh, perform to uh, extract information from the knowledge graph. And these queries, again, can be a bit verbose, but I hopefully uh, easy to understand. So yes, le let's go with, uh, with the flow and import all the libraries that we need and prepare some helping functions. And here's where we begin our workflows, of course, by loading the corresponding knowledge graph, again, using the utilities of this on and tools library that uh, we are defining. And once we have loaded the knowledge graph, we can st start extracting uh, information from it. So the first thing we need to do is to get the connectivity of the network. So the edges and nodes that are taking uh, part in this uh, mechanism. So here we are already using SparkQL queries, but because this is a very common operation, probably the first thing we always want to do with a chemical reaction network knowledge graph, which is retrieving the chemical reaction network, this is already built in the code. So it can be done in, a, done in just a couple of lines of code. So running this, we take the knowledge graph and we immediately build this. Uh, well, it may take a bit more a moment to load the knowledge graph. And here we have this visualization of the reaction network graph. So this is the scaffold of our, our mechanism, but we can do much better than that. We can get much more informative. The second thing we want to do is to extract the actual information from the calculations. So here is with actual SparkQL starts appearing. There is a kind of interface that we have developed to make the way in which we define the queries a bit more Pythonic. So it's easier to handle, but the final query that we get, it will have this format. This is pure SparkQL language. And I won't go into the details of SparkQL, of course, because that may take a bit more time than we have. But the core idea is that we select a set of properties in the same bin that we will do when using SQL or more traditional databases. And then we specify the relationships uh, between elements based on the ontorexen uh, ontology that allow us to extract the part of the graph that we are interested in. So the conditions that we need to go from this full knowledge graph to get a part of it that fills some conditions, like, for example, in here, uh, asking for the property uh, has gives free energy. So, of course, to locate the gives free energy or has inky or a mapping a species to a calculation and so on. So we build the query with this kind of syntax, which can be the more complex or time consuming part of the process. But once we get the query, which is pretty compact indeed, we can easily run it against the knowledge graph and very quickly uh, retrieve the information we want. So in this case, we have these internal identifiers for the stages, so the intermediates and transition states of the network. We also have the more human-friendly name of these, um, of these states. We have the Gibbs free energy and we have the Inky. It's worth noting also that here we are already considering that some of some of these stages may be composed by several molecules. For example, the case in which we have already fragmented the indole into two different uh, parts and therefore into two different calculations. So here, for example, we have uh, two different inkies corresponding to the two fragments that we have obtained. And here the energy 
has already considered the addition of the energies of the, these two fragments, which is another important part of our parting that we are really uh, putting together the individual calculations with how the network says that these calculations are mixed up or are added up as we will need to do, for example, to build a reaction energy profile as we were discussing uh, before. So from here, we already have finished with the knowledge graph, more or less. We have all the information that we need in this table here, and we just need to um, do some work by reorganizing the information to get the visualization that we want. So first of all, we just want to get a cleaner graph. So the already this does already look better than the previous one. We have a more compact layout and we have the names of the individual calculations, but we still want to do better and make this uh, more understandable. So we want relative energies for all of these nodes. And the first thing we need to do to compute something relative is to decide the reference. So in this case, we are getting the energy of our reference, which is a minimum two which uh, we saw before the geometry indeed, and it's just the indole molecule. So it makes sense to select this reference for the decomposition of indole. And then we just clean up the inkies that we have uh, collected and we get this list of, of the individual inkies of all the molecules. Uh, I haven't mentioned why we are taking the inky and how we are defining it. The thing is that uh, first IOCMBD defines an inky for the calculations that we upload. It's nice to have a more cheminformatics related identifier that we can use for our results. And then we are feeding this inky to RTKit to build these to the molecular representations that we want to showcase in the final graph. So this is why we have the inky together with the energy. And then we just keep on uh, mapping things. We end up getting this, uh, well, right here we are uh, transform, even actually transforming the inkies to molecules in RTKit and computing the relative energies by subtracting the reference and sending things to kcalpermol because it's the unit I use the most often. So the energies from now on will be in kcalpermol. And now we already have all the information. So for every entry, we have this list of all the molecule fragments that are involved and the final uh, relative energy of that state. And now we just need to uh, do some RTKit magic and some workarounds to produce the corresponding uh, molecular visualizations in uh, in the right size and format. And now everything is ready and we can go with uh, preparing the reaction network graph as we did before, but now eventually adding these two things that we have been uh, working with from the knowledge graph, which is the image of the involved molecule or molecules and the relative energy of the states. And by running uh, this, we can uh, get this visualization, which, as I have said, has all the core information about the system. So we can see how the decomposition uh, pathways happen and which transformations are occurring and also how feasible or unfeasible they are. Uh, if you think that the energies here are too high, you are right, but the thing is that this was a pyrolytic decomposition, so there was quite a lot of energy to be spent. And of course, if we wanted this image to be a publication quality, we will need to do some tweaking on things because, of course, there are uh, things that are overlapping and it could look a bit better. But the nice thing is that in with this approach, we are doing all of this automatically and we go from uh, the data in IOCMBD to a chemical reaction network knowledge graph to uh, this kind of informative visualization in very few steps. And as I have said, uh, once we have uh, built this for this system, we could apply to any other system that we have defined in this manner. So we spend the fourth ones and then we can get this kind of visualizations or the kind of workflow we want to do many more times without a uh, major efforts anymore. So this was the example I wanted to showcase because I think it was a nice way to bring together uh, computational chemistry and cheminformatics and data visualization with this kind of reaction network. But we have done several other things, several other procedures with the same spirit, with the same idea of taking SparkQL to extract information from the knowledge graph and do things automatically. So these are a couple of examples that we have used, just uh, building the energy profiles embedded in a network. Also, uh, when for simple and for much more complex systems, here indeed we use the structure of the knowledge graph 
of um, a quite complex uh, self-assembly process of polyoxometallates to be able to determine the most favored reaction uh, pathway in this very highly connected network, which was not a trivial uh, task by any means. And finally, we have also employed this strategy to automatically build microkinetic models from knowledge graphs, extracting the stoichiometry of all the involved uh, chemical reactions, as well as the corresponding barriers and rate constants to prepare a microkinetic model. And well, that was, uh, I would say, uh, everything on I wanted to say about knowledge graphs and the connection with IOCMBD. So if you have any question, I'll be happy to, to answer as good as again. Thanks.